Good morning. My name is George Nash, and I am a commentator as well as de facto chair of this first panel, which is devoted to legacies of Wilsonianism and progressivism in the 1920s. We have come here to celebrate a book, which Katie Sibley just mentioned. And I think I can speak for my colleagues, and I trust for all of you in congratulating Katie on a magnificent achievement. And I want to second her remarks of thanks and appreciation to Professor McAllister and the others here at Williams for hosting the event and for all the courtesies that you have extended to all of us. This book will be not only a subject of celebration, but also, as indicated, a point of departure for reassessing the field. The title of the conference is Reflections on the New Era, Reassessing the 1920s. So we will be doing some of that as well. Our panelists in this first panel all are contributors to the volume and all have impressive credentials. I think it's appropriate to begin this session by quoting Calvin Coolidge. His speech to the State Senate of Massachusetts in 1915 upon the occasion of his re-election as president of the State Senate. He said, honorable senators, my sincerest thanks I offer you. Conserve the firm foundations of our institutions. Do your work with the spirit of a soldier in the public service. Be loyal to the Commonwealth and to yourselves. And be brief. Above all, be brief. <laughs> 44 words, the entirety of his speech to the state senators. So perhaps that will be a model to some degree. <laughs> as we proceed with these explorations. Our first speaker is Christopher McKnight Nichols, Assistant Professor of History at Oregon State University, author of the book Promise and Peril, America at the Dawn of a Global Age, and the intrepid co-editor of a book in progress, a companion to this companion volume, dealing with the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. If there were a door prize for attending this conference from the greatest distance, I suspect he would win it, since he does come to us from the other coast. Be that as it may, it is my pleasure to welcome him to hear his remarks on this subject. Thanks, George. Thanks very much. Thanks especially to Katie Sibley for bringing us all here. We wouldn't be here without this volume, which she so adeptly edited, shepherded through, I'm sure, uh, quite a few nightmarish contributors and other issues <laughs> like that. And thanks also to James McAllister. This is the second time I've had the pleasure of being at Williams in the last six months or so. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's wonderful to be here. Great dynamic place for intellectual exchanges. And thanks to Veronica Bosley and Carrie Green and everybody else. Um, so this morning I'm tasked with a daunting, uh, daunting sort of duty of opening our discussions on Wilsonianism uh, itself, a topic uh, so complicated that you know scores of books have been written on this, um, and made all the more formidable because so many of you here today, uh, here in this room on this panel, uh, are scholars whose work I deeply respect and uh, who have written so capably. Uh, on the subject. So these are just preliminary comments in some ways. Nevertheless, in my remaining something like nine minutes, trying to keep brief, uh, I'll do my very best to sketch out a few uh, directions uh, and I think hopefully open up some questions that will run through a lot of our conversations today. Uh, so first I'd like to narrow my own topic a little bit by discussing and differentiating um, two competing visions of Wilson's legacy. Uh, as they sort of fit into the nomenclature of Wilson himself. Um, when one looks at the origins and developments of concepts, um, the two key ones that stand out to me are Wilsonian and Wilsonianism um, in the new era and as they evolved thereafter. And then I'll turn briefly uh, to, see, to talk a little bit about what I see as connected domestic and foreign relations discourses on Wilsonian politics and on Wilsonianism as a kind of capacious ideology, hotly contested, uh, and uh, subject to lots of different types of interpretations, changing not just in the 20s and 30s, but all the way through our present moment. So in the 100 years since Woodrow Wilson, a little over 100, 101 years since he took office, his ideas and actions have cast a long shadow over American domestic and international politics, as all of us here know well. His successes and failures as governor of New Jersey, uh, as two-term president, as well as uh, Princeton president, were vigorously debated in his day and have been ever since. 
Throughout the presidencies of Harding, of Coolidge, of Hoover, and the Republican-dominated Congresses that followed Wilson's time in the White House, his achievements, his failures, and his grand visions hovered over the politics of the so-called new era, right? Wilson is really looming in the background for so much of what goes on in the 20s and 30s. Discussions over the meanings and outcomes of Wilson's ideas and actions have led to him becoming a standard bearer for several hotly contested and often vaguely defined sets of political positions. So what is Wilsonianism? What, is it, what does it mean to be a Wilsonian in terms of reform politics? The one point of consensus among scholars, politicians, and citizens, starting as early as the 20s, running from his death in 24 onward, all the way through the present, has been that pro Wilsonian progressivism and Wilsonian visions of internationalism decisively shaped American domestic and international politics. Whether they were negative or positive is the key sort of valence that interpreters have had to deal with. Domestic affairs, we'll hear a lot more about this. Wilson helped to bring about significant new economic reforms, the establishment of the federal income tax, the Federal Reserve, etc. In international affairs, Wilson brought the US into World War I. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of that now and commemorating it. Idealistically, he campaigned for a global effort to, quote, make the world safe for democracy, as we all know, and he championed the League of Nations. Now, were these positive moves or were these negative moves? Were these centralizing efforts or, and idealistic efforts? Or were these the naive efforts of a, of a moralizer and an idealist? Again. These are the valences that we grapple with and people in the moment were as well. So wide ranging was Wilson's influence that his name has become both an adjective and a noun. And this is maybe the highest compliment for an American politician, <laughs> right? An Ian and an ism, Wilsonian, Wilsonianism. Um, and with each word sort of refining to two distinct schools of thought, and this is what I, I hope that we'll be able to tease out more as we go through the various panels. Um, Wilsonianism, uh, maybe the more influential, but it's slightly less used, noun form of his name. It usually, usually refers to an idealistic, liberal, internationalist foreign relations stance premised on such notions and also hotly contested and open for interpretation, such notions as self-determination, economic globalization, and collective security. Lloyd Ambrosius, for example, has defined Wilsonianism neatly as epitomizing the liberal tradition in American foreign relations. Wilson's efforts to achieve a, quote, peace without victory, to proclaim terms to resolve the war, to establish a new global order in its 14 points in January 1918, uh, and to promote the League more broadly, are fundamental to the meanings and ramifications of Wilsonian, uh, Wilsonianism. Um, indeed, Wilsonianism has had such national and international traction that Frank Ninkovich, for example, in 1999, deployed the term, um, the, the adjective form, Wilsonian, to describe a whole century. Right? It was a Wilsonian century. After him came all the Wilsonians. Even contesting him, you had to deal with the legacy of Wilsonian internationalism. Um, as Nikovich acutely states, a study of the Wilsonian century points beyond Wilsonianism to a concern for understanding a process in which a world full of strangers has become a global society. So that's the process that he sees as essential to understanding that which is Wilsonian. Such views also have not been the province of admirers alone. One thing that's the most interesting about Wilsonian and Wilsonianism is how often they're invoked by uh, those who oppose these concepts and uh, sort of embraced by those figures. How so? Uh, no less than the arch critic Henry Kissinger ruefully noted in 1994 that Wilsonianism has survived while history has bypassed the reservations of his contemporaries. Poor Henry Cabot Lodge, right? Um, Despite the use of Wilsonian in terms of foreign relations, as Ninkovich and others have applied it, it's the adjective form, it's Wilsonian, that is more dominant in political discourse. And if you do n-gram searches and keyword searches, you'll find Wilsonian is the far more common uh, usage here. Um, in fact, and this is something I wanted to posit to us to, to think a little bit about, both terms uh, develop, they, they first originate in 1915. They, they're used uh, quite widely between 1915 and 1921. Through keyword searches, you, you can find this quite easily. Then they go into quiescence for much of the 20s. Very little usage of the terms Wilsonian and Wilsonianism. Some, but not too much. Starting in 1931, you see a, a significant rise in use of Wilsonian in particular, and to a lesser extent, Wilsonianism. Tracking over time, one of the more interesting things about these two terms is that they have different spikes. So Wilsonianism uh, spikes in the early 70s, 1970 and 71. And uh, its peak is the 90s and the present. 
Wilsonianism has become a major question for historians, for politicians, and others. It's much more invoked now. Wilsonian, however, over the course of the 20th century, peaked uh, roughly uh, in the 90s. It has dropped in usage since 1994. Um, and it appeared uh, uh, to really dominate discourse about uh, progressive politics and the legacy of Wilson in the 30s. That's, that's the, really the key moment for Wilsonian questions. So um, despite that, uh, Wilsonian is the exceedingly common historical uh, term, uh, and it's used to refer to Wilson's style, I would argue, as much as any of the practical politics. To be Wilsonian is about style, and it, partly uh, that's what prompts the sort of emotional or visceral reaction to Wilson's politics. And you see this in a lot of the scholarship, um, particularly in the former acolytes of his. So uh, people like uh, Joseph Tumulty or um, Josephus Daniels, when they were writing about him, they talked about a Wilsonian great statesman, the man that they knew. They tried to redeem this individual, this stylist in politics, by talking about a Wilsonian style. Nevertheless, domestic Wilsonian views were knotted together with Wilsonianism from 1915 onward. Um, and this is a point I want to highlight, especially here at the outset for us all, um, that, that this is a moment, infusing the two, um, that we can see uh, the contours of something that Casey Johnson has written about, a lot of people here have, which is that this was not an interwar era. Right? This is what um, Katie was beginning with as well. No one living in the 20s and 30s thought that they lived between two major world wars. Sure, there were prescient, prescient predictions that another war was coming. But in knotting together the Wilsonian vision of a style of international relations and a Wilsonianism as a kind of capacious ideology for how to engage with the world, one thing that's pretty clear, these figures were looking for, and the historians who were writing about it, were looking for a, a path to peace. Now, some of these things seem naive to us. Some of the achievements, the Keller Grand Pact or uh, Washington Naval Conferences, and we could pick a whole host of other examples here. Um, but the point being that this was not an interwar years, and I want us from the, from the out, th these were not interwar years. This nomenclature is wrong, and you also don't see this in the scholarship on Wilsonian and Wilsonianism. Um, people are choosing very different paths, uh, Coolidge, Harding, Hoover, but all towards peace not towards creating a more warlike world. So I, I wanted to get that out there. So then on, in terms of cycles of revisionism and Wilsonian Wilsonianism, I know I've only got a couple more minutes, uh, I wanted to just sketch out a few key questions in this literature. And I could, we could spend a long time talking about the authors and the thinkers on this, and I'd be happy to talk about that. But for now, let's just talk about a few key questions. To my mind, uh, the cycles of revisionism between the wars and on the historiography thereafter um, highlight the historical profile of Wilson and his legacy as one that can't be characterized so much as sequential. There aren't sort of sequences of it. It's more like sedimented. What I mean by that is that there's at least three main layers of analysis, three main sedimentary layers, that have been uh, most prominent in the development of accounts of Wilson's legacy since he left uh, the White House in the spring of 21. As with many historical cases, the highly charged present day implications of his life, of his ideas, and his actions have continued to add urgency to archival research, to rethinking and reassessing the interwar year, the 20s and the 30s, with the valence, again, of what would Wilson have done, or how did Wilson's actions impact present questions. So, too, we see remarkably similar patterns in rethinking of the US role in World War I. And I would argue that these are closely tied together. The rethinking of the US entrance into the conflict is very much tied to rethinking of Wilson. What is Wilsonianism? What is it to be Wilsonian? So the first main layer of Wilson historiography uh, that I'd like to highlight revolves around the deceptively simple related dual question, one that we'll have a whole uh, parts of this panel and other panels will be on. How progressive was Wilson? And how progressive were his reform efforts? This is a can of worms question, set of questions. And certainly every historian who deals with Wilson significantly has to deal with this, this issue. A second important theme in the historical scholarship addresses the question, how idealist and how moralist was Wilson? How, how much did those values really impact his practical politics? Or are these more rhetorical questions, rhetorical impulses for him? Third, a perhaps impossible question that has transfixed academics beyond, well beyond the historical field in political science, uh, in, and in the waves of historiography that have followed, has been the question of how much did Wilson's fragile health influence his psychology and politics? Now here we get into a, another set of thorny questions about counterfactuals. Uh, perhaps the most uh, important one in some ways that was voiced in the era itself uh, was if Wilson had died in 1919 or 1920, what would have happened? 
and uh, speculation of the era is rife with the, the singular answer that the Democrats would have passed the reservations on the League and the U.S. would have joined the League. Now, we can debate whether or not we think this counterfactual is true, but nevertheless, that inflects all these questions about his ill health. Um, so I'd be glad to chat about all those, but I wanted to quickly just summarize a couple of the key moments of scholarship. So in 19, we see almost immediately after and, and as Wilson is leaving the, the White House, uh, Sidney Fay is the first to lay out a strong case uh, for what Wilson was up to and um, in a series of essays in the American Historical Review in 1920 and 1921, debunking the sort of legend of the Potsdam Conference. Uh, and I could go on with this, but I just, I'll just sketch a few of the other moments. Perhaps the first major attack that comes out on Wilson and Wilsonianism, uh, invoking the term Wilsonian, is Henry Cabot Lodge's The Senate and the League of Nations, which was published in 1925, the year after he and Wilson died. Uh, Lodge makes three main arguments, and these will help us, I think, think through a number of questions. He makes one major argument that Wilson should have acted more vigorously and earlier. He makes a second main argument that uh, as he maligns Wilson's idealistic stance on the League, he calls it just unworkable. Right? Essentially, this is the kind of vision of foreign relations that simply can't work. Um, and third, he criticizes Wilson's intransigence uh, regarding the reservations themselves. Moving onward, uh, this is the kind of, uh, of work uh, that, that a number of other historians um, uh, slot into. Harry Elmer Barnes, for example, The Genesis of the World War, 1926. Uh, C. Hartley Grattan's Why We Fought, 1929. Uh, Schmidt, uh, Coming of the War, 1914, uh, and a host of other things. And actually, Justice Donaghy will probably be talking about some of these um, and knows far better than I uh, this historiography. Um, but then, in, in comparison, we also have the acolytes. So we have Joseph Tumulty, we've got uh, Josephus Daniels, we've got others. Uh, as uh, I'll summarize, Daniels saying um, in 1921, uh, I felt the compulsion looking back to glory to record from an inside seat the story of how Wilson won every battle for the domestic reforms embodied in his new freedom and strengthened international relations. So this is the sort of uh, claim that you see coming out of those who were supporters of his. So the battle begins just right as he's leaving the office, uh, the White House. I think I'll conclude with a comment just at the end. So back, coming back to the interwar years. Um, one of the most prescient books of this era that also invokes Wilsonian questions and concerns is E.H. Carr's The Twenty uh, Years Crisis. Um, Carr argued that Wilson's aspirational aim that, quote, if it won't work, it must be made to work for the League, amounted to a central, I would argue, and widely shared intellectual failing of the era. Uh, that's the argument uh, of Carr. Um, Carr's, uh, as Norman Grabner, for example, observed, Wilson's views pervaded the writings of many of those statesmen who followed him and led to a kind of legal fetishism in US foreign policy. Carr detected and rejected this in 1939, rejected the kind of idealistic, legalistic, and seemingly deterministic aspiration to achieve world peace through supranational organizations and to achieve transformative politics at home. Um, and so I would take, taking us all the way up to the present in some of the historiography on Wilson, I'd argue that this, uh, from Carr to subsequent realist critics of Wilson, such as Walter Lippmann or George Kennan or Hans Morgenthau, and up through the most uh, recent scholarly assessments that are more positive of, say, Ambrosius or Bacevich, um, the historical lessons are clear. In this era, in the 20s especially, in rethinking Wilson, in rethinking Wilsonianism, the issue was, should aspiration govern international relations and domestic politics? So I'll leave it at that, and hopefully we can answer or find some preliminary answers to that question. Our next speaker is John Fox. If there were a door prize for the speaker with the most intriguing affiliation, he would win it. He has been for a number of years now a historian for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. He has been very active both inside the Bureau and in public outreach programs, as I understand. However, if any of you are anticipating a talk on the influence of progressivism on J. Edgar Hoover, <laughs> you will have to wait for another day. <laughs> but we will, I think, hear something very interesting from him. His topic is what happened to the progressive spirit in the 20s, with particular reference to the social welfare policy during that decade. So please come to the platform.
George, and thank you, Katie, for this chance to exercise my social history muscles rather than uh, those dealing with gangsters and spies and such. Um, the title of my work in progress is The Progressive Bureau, but that is not my topic today. Rather, what I wanted to look at was the issue of what happened to progressivism in the 1920s. Of course, um, a good strain of our historiography starts off with Warren Harding's campaign, and he says that we are looking for normalcy, not nostrums. And taking off or riffing from that, of course, many of our fellow historians over the years, have, from Charles Beard in the 20s through, have said that the 20s was a period of reaction, of rejection of that progressive spirit of progressive reform until the Great Depression and the movement of the government after that. And so what I'd like to talk about briefly is social reform in three areas, uh, women, children, and veterans, very key parts of our social policy, both developing through the progressive era and, of course, since then, and put that into the context of what was going on in the 20s and consider that question, what happened to the progressive reform movements? So. If we think about it, obviously the first 20 years of the 20th century had seen tremendous change in this country. Population, ethnicity, um, technology, communications. Uh, I've always liked Weedy's um, phrase that we move from a, a bunch of islands to interconnected communities. And obviously that's the case there. The progressive era, of course, itself was characterized by a, a, an energy. That, that some saw captured in Teddy Roosevelt, others saw in the, the explosion of associations that sought change, whether it was from the moral suasion efforts of groups that you know, tried to change individual behavior to those, of course, pushing a more European welfare state or the creation of a nation state. And of course, um, one of the, the strains of historiography that I found most useful for understanding change over time here is some of that state building um, effort that, that uh, many historians have taken to. So in the 20s, did we stop? Did we take, take a breath? Was, was Warren Harding's will to normalcy um, conclusive in the sense of putting an end to progressive reform until it, it rebutted in the 1930s? For women, of course, uh, the, the decade starts off with the most significant change in our political history, the grantage of suffrage. And the groups that, of course, had, had led the suffrage movement all of a sudden had this victory under their belts and began pushing for new things. Of course, in the progressive era itself, uh, women's issues had been changing rapidly, uh, whether it was new occupations, um, Sexual relations, of course, uh, the birth control movement was mentioned as one, and uh, the movement of women into white collar jobs, you know, whether it was in department stores or others, or if we look more into the area of women trafficking and the passage of the Mann Act and the impact that that had for a time on the country. Those issues continue through the 20s. Um, they did not stop. But what we see is a changing in the approach. What impact did uh, suffrage have on the nation's politics? Well, uh, for those who thought that it would usher in a radical change in policy, that obviously didn't happen. Women voted very similarly to men in many respects. Um, but our voting roles increased by a great number. Women's issues remained at the fore, but the groups that had pushed for suffrage began to fragment and look for new things. And that's not surprising. you know. As one victory is won in, in that kind of public sphere, uh, you look to other things. And all of a sudden, the coalition that comes around one issue realizes, hey, we don't always have commonalities here, and they, they split to others. Of course, children's welfare was an important issue for much of the, many of those groups that were involved in women's issues. Uh, they were seen as, as, as fitting together. And the decade starts off with the creation of the Children's Bureau. And we get um, changes, of course, throughout the progressive era in children's uh, welfare policies. Uh, child labor laws, of course, um, although passed initially, get struck down by the Supreme Court, but they remain an issue through the 1920s. But if you look at some of the, the social cultural changes with regards to children, you know, the increasing size of the middle class, 
um, changes in public education, especially in, in public school funding. You look at um, the redefinition in the sense of childhood, especially in the 1920s, we start to see, well, you know, if you think of um, Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, it's a bit later, but it kind of gives that image of the 1920s high school kid, although he was a little old for that at the time, but, you know, in his beaver hat with his, you know, fan paraphernalia, the, the image of the 20s child was changing some of those debates, and it goes, you know, in part to, to some of what we were talking about with H.L. Mencken last night. You know, there was that one strain of, of you know, this nihilism, and, and did it um, influence uh, Leopold and Lold, Loeb when they, they um, were tried for murder? Uh, you know, very much a cultural debate at the time. So as far as children's welfare issues were going, those two were continuing. The debate was still there. Um, welfare, of course, was seen to be primarily that state or local matter, not a national issue. And, and we see that in the 1920s, that these issues of where reform should be are slowly progressing more towards national level rather than state and local level. And of course, that was characteristic of the earlier years as well. And perhaps the biggest one's veterans issues. I, obviously, in the, the wake of World War I, the welfare of veterans became a paramount concern because all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are injured are returning home. Uh, the Grand Army of the Republic was, was giant. It was stood up very quickly, and it was demobilized very quickly. And the concurrent issues were immense. Veterans' welfare was our first quasi-national welfare issue, in a sense, following the Civil War. Um, of course, there was that North-South kind of bifurcation there, because you know, it was Southern states tended to, to pay the pensions of the Confederate soldiers, and the Northern states, where the, um, the national government took over the uh, Union soldiers. But many of them had been dying out by the Wilson years. And all of a sudden, we have this new crop of veterans. We have the, the realization of, well, we call it post-traumatic shock today, but shell shock, of some of the mental health issues with this. And what is the nation's responsibility to its soldiers? And now it is a national issue. We have the creation of a veterans department. And we see this first move towards creating national bureaucratic structures to deal with these social welfare issues. And, you know, of course, there, there's some, some back tread there because the Veterans Affairs Department, of course, falls into, you know, some of the corruption issues and its head gets eventually sent to jail, which, of course, doesn't help the progress of any reform movement. That does tend to put a, a crimp in those efforts. <laughs> but, obviously, we still have the Veterans <coughs> Affairs Department today and it still plays a signal role in our government. So, in each of these issues, I think we are seeing this change over time from a looser, associational, more state and local directed efforts. And the current through the 20s is this move towards starting bureaucratic structures, towards creating, in a sense, that, that more modern welfare state. So I would characterize this period not as, as a period of reaction as much as one of just taking a breath from the changes. You know, you have to build on your successes. You have to address the changing um, coalitions that you face. And you have to move in different directions because nothing stays still, especially in politics. And so it, it's a fascinating period for that. And obviously, I think that um, you know, as we look at the current historiography, it really shows this diversity. We see um, you know, women entering into positions of power in a very limited way. I'm uh, Mabel Willebrandt in the Justice Department, um, highest ranking you know, female official in the government at the time. We see increasing um, numbers of women lawyers, even though how they're going to practice the law is something to be worked out because they're still facing all those hurdles that had been there. We see these small changes moving forward. And so I, I look at the period as one of, of continued progress in many of those same issues. And in this, I'm going to put in a plug for the, 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 the Bureau, simply because I figure I've got to say something about it. But, <laughs> you know, the Bureau was a creature of the progressive era. Uh, 
and it had many of its strengths and weaknesses, and J. Edgar Hoover was also, which is interesting. You know, he very much fit in with many of those models of progressive reform, and of course had, of co had you know, we, we see those dark elements of the progressive era, he had those as well. And you see that in the Bureau. So as the Bureau begins to grow under Hoover between 24 and 1934, Hoover's first 10 years, you see this change as America starts moving towards a more national look at certain problems. In this case, crime. You know, of course, historically, crime was a state and local matter. Over the course of the 20th century, though, our federal criminal code has go gone from a comic book to multiple shelves in the law school library. And as it has done so, the Bureau of Investigation and then the FBI's authority increased. And so I think these movements are very much part of this period of normalcy, as it has been called, although really it's just a continuation on, and modification of that earlier progressive reform. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker among the regular presenters is Justice Donachie, known I'm sure to many of you, particularly for his excellent meticulous books and articles on American anti-interventionism before World War II. He is really a foremost authority in that field. In 2011, he published a volume entitled Nothing Less Than War, A New History of America's Entry into World War I. Although he is an emeritus professor of history at New College of Florida, he is exemplary in that he is using his retirement to write more books. And he has another one in progress dealing with the end of the war and the election of World War I and the election of 1920. He's going to venture a little further afield from that and talk about Hoover and FDR. Justice. First, I want to thank Katie and the staff of Williams College. I'm proud to say that three presidents of my own alma mater uh, came from Williams College, and one of my former students is on the Williams College faculty now. So this is great fun. From the time of the New Deal until the 1970s, most historians stress discontinuity between the Hoover and Roosevelt programs. Hoover's 1934 book, The Challenge to Liberty, started the attack. Hoover's speeches, published in volumes entitled Addresses on the American Road, attacked practically every feature of the New Deal program. And the same thing holds for volume three of his memoirs, The Great Depression, in which he argues that the New Deal wrecked his efforts at restoration while seeking to make America over into a collective system. Exact quotation. Hoover continually saw two worlds in conflict, individual liberty versus government dictation. Hoover did repudiate laissez-faire. He endorsed old age pensions, unemployment relief, and farm credits. But in his speeches, he specifically denied he was the father of the New Deal, and in fact he claimed this is the saddest blow of all. But there are some curious asides. In 1948, Hoover told Newsweek, that only TVA and the Securities Act came from other sources. And this was something affirmed by R Rexford Tugwell, the New Dealer uh, par excellence. And then Herbert Hoover told Tom Dewey that he would have signed the very measures FDR did. But these are little asides that are in one or two sentences long amid this huge corpus of Hoover writings blasting the New Deal. Turning to the New Deal, Though FDR never wrote memoirs, for many years historians, who were often ardently pro-New Deal, saw no continuity. Many spoke of the Roosevelt Revolution. Such representatives, even of the consensus school, as Richard Hofstadter, saw a sharp break. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. set the dominant tone in his 1957 book, The Crisis of the Old Order. Schlesinger denied that Hoover was a do-nothing president, but he was neither a modernizer nor a progressive. His politics during the Depression, and I quote, amounted to little more than defense of business syndicalism against social control, a defense delivered with an engineer's dogmatism and packed in Quaker cot. Uh, 
Both camps really found it to their advantage to stress the differences. In fact, Robert Sherwood said, Herbert Hoover is a good act to follow. Richard Norton Smith said, Hoover is a black bishop to Roosevelt's white knight. And uh, FDR, when he was approached in 1940 about having Hoover direct some food relief overseas, this was during the, the, at the beginning of World War II, says, I'm not about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Yet beginning in the 1970s, some historians were becoming more sympathetic to Hoover. The Herbert Hoover Presidential Library opened in 1966, allowing access to a rich collection of manuscripts and many books and doctoral theses. Joan Hoff Wilson, for example, and Joan in the past 40 years has gone back to the name Joan Hoff, in 1975 wrote Herbert Hoover Forgotten Progressive. And Katie referred to this in her introductory remarks. The very title is revealing. And Joan Wilson says this, no other 20th century American statesman has had the range of interest and breadth of understanding of domestic and economic problems, nor has any developed such a consistent and comprehensive scientific organizational approach for dealing with the political economy of the United States. All right, that takes in quite a few people in uh, that eulogy. But Joan Wilson herself sees discontinuity, as in her words, New Deal liberals strayed from such Hoover tenets as Jeffersonian agrarian values, decentralized government, the dignity of every individual. Similarly, Glenn Jensen, is it Johnson or Jensen? Jensen. Jensen. Glenn Jensen calls Hoover the right man in the right place for his times, a man who dealt with staggering crises competently and on the whole wisely. In contrast is the New Deal, flawed by waste, corruption, and the return of the spoil system. Uh, I could use some comments from uh, my own father in this regard, but uh, probably not for this learned audience. Right? <laughs> Even in the 1930s, however, there were some commentators that stressed continuity. In 1935, Walter Lippmann wrote an influential article in the Yale Review. Here he denied that a new era began on March 4, 1933. Rather, Hoover anticipated the main features of the New Deal program. Lippmann offered an entire list of New Deal measures that he claimed Hoover had initially launched. Similarly, Harris Warren's 1959 book, Hoover and the Great Depression, found Hoover offering several proto-New Deal measures, among them hydroelectric projects, housing loans, and old age insurance. In 1963, Carl Degler used the Yale Review to claim that both Hoover and Roosevelt sharply departed from laissez-faire. Hoover saw big business needing controls. He thought government had the responsibility for alleviating the depression. Time forbids going into other authors who made similar observations, Grant McConnell, Frank Friedel, Robert McIlvain, but I doubt if anyone was prepared for the iconoclastic interpretation offered by three distinct schools of thought. First are the libertarians, who see little difference in both men. The philosophical anarchist Albert J. Nock accused Hoover of subsidizing stock jobbers, speculators, and shavers, while FDR funded a rival group of job holders, hangers-on, single-crop farmers, unemployed persons, bonus seekers, and hobos. According to Nock, both presidents used public funds for ruinous purposes. And when Hoover's book, The Challenge to Liberty, appeared in 1934, Nock quipped, think of such a book on such a topic by such a man. Now, one might dismiss Nock as an eccentric crank, but it's harder to argue with, with an economist from Chase National Bank who had taught at both Harvard and Columbia. This is Benjamin N. Anderson, whose 1949 book, Economics and the Public Welfare, attacked what he called Hoover's New Deal, particularly Hoover's agricultural policies. The most extensive libertarian attack came from economist Murray Rothbard, an ardent disciple of the Austrian free market school of economics represented by Ludwig von Mises. In 
Hoover was the very founder of the New Deal, in Rothbard's words, a status par excellence. Even Hoover's stress on the voluntary nature of his program embodied the male fist in the velvet glove, for there always remained a threat of federal co uh, coercion. And if Murray, who I knew quite well were here, he'd say, monstrous, absolutely monstrous. Second is the influence of William Appleman Williams, the renowned founder of the Wisconsin School of Diplomatic History. In works such as The Contours of American History, which is not a very easy read, and in several very influential essays, New York Review of Books, Williams praised Hoover as the key leader of enlightened executives. Hoover understood the corporate economy. Hoover offered a most thorough program for underwriting future prosperity. Williams said Hoover initiated most of the New Deal, but Hoover, unlike FDR, would not abandon his belief in an authentic American cooperative community. To Williams, FDR substituted mere pragmatism and political skill for a working knowledge of the industrial system. Citizens ended up lacking the ability to participate in many decisions affecting their own liberties. Hoover, in contrast to FDR, says Williams, refused to save the system through means he considered to be destructive of its values and potential. He refused to save the system through means he considered destructive of its values and potential. If, writes Williams, Hoover outlined the basic shape of the New Deal, he balked at taking the last steps into a kind of corporate state capitalism he feared would destroy democracy. Third are historians offering what is called the corporatist interpretation. Foremost of these, covering the 1930s, is Ellis Hawley, long at the University of Iowa. In a series of articles, Hawley wrote, and I quote, Hoover was a type of collectivist planner. Hoover's rejection of laissez-faire and development of associational activities paved the way for the New Deal. Hoover sought a cooperative capitalism that is a decentralized yet harmonious, organic, interdependent social order. This order was organized around and regulated by specialized functionalist groups. It is industrial self-government that provides direction and reform without sacrificing property rights or building oppressive bureaucracies. Hawley sees the real shift under the New Deal as not involving a change from a laissez-faire economy to a planned one, Rather, Hoover sought to manage through informal business government cooperation, FDR fostered a more formal and coercive effect. When I was in grad school, I went back to college, went back to college to see one of my former professors. And I was very full of Civil War, really Reconstruction, revisionism, and how Eric McKittrick and Robert Sharkey were challenging the works of Howard Beale and before that William Dodd and James Ford Rhodes. And the man who was trained under William Dodd at the University of Chicago in 1934 pondered a bit, looked me straight in the eye, and said, Justice, revisionists always think they're getting closer to the truth. But did you ever think that with each revision, they're getting further and further away from the truth? So. Are these revisionists onto something new? Or as Voltaire once said, history is a game of tricks played upon the dead. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now some comments. We have just heard three fine presentations on two venerable themes in the historiography of the 1920s, namely what happened to progressivism during that era, and secondly, the question of continuity and discontinuity between the, the end of the 20s, if you will, the Hoover period, and what immediately followed it. Professor Nichols' comments, I think, very effectively remind us of something that was said by a historian years ago, that we do not live in the past, the past lives in us. His comments reminded me of how frequently we still use the terms and categories and concepts associated with Woodrow Wilson 
it's, I'm struck by how much the, if you will, the Wilsonian worldview has imprinted itself on our consciousness, maybe even our subconsciousness, and how much we are willy-nilly Wilson's heirs. But are we also his prisoners? Recently, there has arisen a body of scholarly literature in the last decade or so that has become highly critical of Wilson, Wilsonianism, and of progressivism in general as a political philosophy. One book that just recently came out by Richard Streiner, a professor of history, I think, at Washington College, is entitled Woodrow Wilson and World War I, A Burden Too Great to Bear. Just came out this year, too late to be included in the, the compendium of bibliography. So far as I can judge, it is the most systematic, scorching, archivally based critique of Wilson's wartime leadership that we have ever had from a professional historian. And it is a book, I suspect, that has to be reckoned with. Another book is Richard, Ronald J. Pestrito's Woodrow Wilson and the Roots of Modern Liberalism, published in 2005. Still another is this one, just came out last year, The American State from the Civil War to the New Deal, subtitle significantly, The Twilight of Constitutionalism and the Triumph of Progressivism by Paul D. Moreno. Pastrito and Moreno are colleagues at Hillsdale College. A few weeks ago, perhaps now a few months ago, Philip Hamburger, professor of law at New York or at Columbia Law School, came out with a 635-page tome with this title, Is Administrative Law Unlawful? This is a very interesting work, has much to say about progressivism, Woodrow Wilson to some extent, and the sources of the modern concept of the administrative state uh, in German philosophy and the example of the Prussian state in the 19th century and many other sources. This is not, I think, an eccentric piece of work, but a very learned work by a man who, as far as I know, is an esteemed uh, law professor. More recently, we uh, become aware of Amity Schles's biography, Coolidge, published a year or so ago. And just a few days ago, there was published and reviewed in the Wall Street Journal last Wednesday, not published in the Wall Street Journal, but reviewed there, James Grant's book with this interesting title, The Forgotten Depression, 1921, The Crash That Cured Itself. James Grant is a rather prominent financial writer. Most of this scholarship, I don't know about Streiner, but most of the rest of it, I think one could fairly say, is coming from the intellectual right. And it has two sources. Partly from an expanding network of sophisticated libertarian scholars, often working in the fields of law, political science, and economics. One very prominent website now for scholarly, academically oriented discourse in this area is the Online Library of Law and Liberty. I commend that website to you. I think you would find it interesting. It is sponsored by the Liberty Fund of Indianapolis. It was founded as a website just over almost three years ago. I was told yesterday that it is getting two million hits of uh, visits, uh, views per year. It is caught on and every day there, or every weekday, there is fresh essay activity, mainly by scholars on, in this area. And some of, this, of that scholarship is, I think, become, becoming reflected in some of the books that I've just mentioned. The other source is an increasingly influential school of conservative scholars associated with the Claremont Review of Books, a quarterly published by the Claremont Institute in California. The Claremont group is sometimes labeled the Claremont or West Coast Straussians, since many of them have been influenced by Leo Strauss and his uh, student, Harry Jaffa. In this group's interpretation of American history, it was the progressive movement in the early 20th century, spearheaded by Wilson, which launched an ideological and political revolution that repudiated the philosophy of the Constitution and the American founders. In place of a regime of carefully limited government, grounded in checks and balances, according to this school, the progressives initiated one of potentially unlimited government guided by administrators, bureaucrats, and experts, increasingly insulated from popular consent. 
In place of the traditional understanding, they argue, of our rights as natural and inalienable, see the Declaration of Independence, the progressives, say this school, have claimed that our rights are derived from government, from the state, and could be created or abridged as the custodians of the state deemed expedient in the light of modern social conditions and the perceived imperatives of progress. Most of this scholarly outpouring has arisen too recently to be fully acknowledged in the volume we are celebrating today. But I think as we go forward that we will need to come to terms with it. For again, it seems to me that Wilson and progressivism are coming under a more rigorous scholarly critique than at any time in recent memory. This critique is problematizing progressivism, at least in the minds of those who are writing these books, and with it, the conventional history lesson taught by those who have long been under the influence of progressivism. And I have with me, which I can share later, a printout from the website of the Claremont Institute, which in two pages very nicely summarizes this viewpoint. Moving on to Dr. Fox's comments, I think he effectively makes the point that whatever we think of the political discourse of the 20s and what goes on, went on in Congress and in the White House, that there was a kind of institutional inertia and momentum from progressive, the progressive era in the form of the kind of consolidating efforts that he describes in the fields of social welfare. It's a complicated story because after all, it was Harding, that uh, nabom of normalcy, if I may coin a term, who supported the Shepherd Towner, Towner Act within two months of being president. And there were people on the left who did not like the idea of a federal appropriation of that issue. <clears throat> he referred, uh, Dr. Fox did, to children's issues. I would like to amplify his point by calling attention to the fact that in 1923, Herbert Hoover, became president of a new society which he helped to bring into being called the American Child Health Association. It is discussed in a book of Hoover's just published last year, a posthumously published memoir called The Crusade Years, in which Hoover talks about his crusade for benevolent institutions in this post-presidential period, but there are passages and sections of that uh, memoir volume, which are devoted specifically to the American Child Health Association and other causes with which Hoover was associated. Another one, I don't think it's mentioned in the Crusade Years book, but it was in the 1920s that Hoover was affiliated with the Better Homes in America movement. It was really part of an expanding empire of philanthropy that he developed in that period, subject I think could be of a good doctoral dissertation. And it reminds us that Hoover really was, whatever one thinks of his limitations as a custodian of state, one of the great figures in American philanthropy. And not only, of course, in the United States, but abroad, because it was, after all, uh, his Belgian relief and subsequent episodes abroad that paved the way for his presidency. It has been said of him by an historian some years ago, I don't recall who, that Hoover was responsible for saving more lives than any person who has ever lived. That was with reference to the European relief. But it is a dimension of Hoover that I do think needs to be emphasized further. So perhaps we historians need to look at the 1920s to re-examine it in a sense as it understood itself without knowing that a depression was coming or a great second war. And perhaps we need to look, <clears throat> excuse me, using, without using progressivism as our conscious or unconscious yardstick. Perhaps we should look more closely at the ways that free people in the 1920s pursued social betterment in a Tocquevillian way, if you will. In other words, progress, pursuing progress without progressivism, that is, without necessarily thinking of the state as its commander in chief. So progress without progressivism, possibly a, a way to re-examine the 1920s. And I would just say before leaving Professor Fox and moving on to Professor Donnecke's comments, that we may find, and I don't think I'm original in making this point, but I, I will make it nevertheless, that in some ways the 1920s may appear to us going forward as a more representative decade in our history, a more modern decade even, than the decade or two that followed it. Food for thought. Finally, to Professor Donnecke's comments. <clears throat> 
Again, he has given us a characteristic and very thorough and able review of the evolving historiography of Hoover and Roosevelt. To his comments about the right-wing critique of Roosevelt, uh, the continuity, the, the right wing of the continuity thesis, if you will, he mentions properly Murray Rothbard. There's quite a bit that has happened more recently, much of it deriving from the supply-side economics paradigm that became, you might say, the intellectual economic orthodoxy of the Republican Party in the Reagan era to this day. They were looking, the supply-siders, for a hero for their views, and they found it in Coolidge and Mellon, not in Hoover. I don't have time to go into the various specifics of this, but they argue that there were certain policy errors committed by Hoover, including tax increases in 32. So much of the current right-wing critique of Hoover reduces itself to two or three uh, arguments. Smoot-Hawley tariff was a mistake. Maintaining the wage levels through jawboning of big industry was a mistake, and the tax increase was a mistake they ignore pretty much the rest of the Hoover record. It does, though, bring us in conclusion to that old question which we will probably continue to discuss today, namely, who was Herbert Hoover? I have argued in an essay published some years ago that he was or became a political orphan. He was an orphan, actually. Unwanted in either the liberal or conservative pantheons. They both see him for different reasons as a loser. I think his very longevity has proven to be an obstacle because, after all, when he died in 1964 at the age of 90, he had just spent half a century or more in public service of one form or another. That is a record that in sheer scope and magnitude may be without parallel in American history. Think of it. A friend and advisor of Woodrow Wilson, a friend of Barry Goldwater in the same lifetime. A friend of Louis Brandeis, who wanted him to be president in 1920, and a friend in the 1950s of Joseph McCarthy. The candidate of the New Republic for president in 19, early 1920 as a progressive Democrat, he ends up being a kind of patron saint and grandfather figure to the post-war American right, a friend of William F. Buckley in National Review, and a supporter of Goldwater in 64. Partly because of the very longevity of his life and the various issues with which he dealt, it's hard to pigeonhole him quickly. We tend to do so in terms of 29 to 33, but there is that vastness of the Hoover landscape that makes it the task harder. I rather like Harris Gaylord Wils uh, Warren's formulation of, about Hoover's years in office, made in Warren's book published in 1959, in which he called Hoover too progressive for the conservatives and too conservative for the radicals. And now we find, as the continuity discontinuity cycle continues, I think the beginning of a possible new wave of Hoover, or at least wavelet, of Hoover revisionism, emphasizing Hoover the conservative. Last year, there was published by two scholars, uh, Gordon Lloyd at Pepperdine, and David Davenport, a, a fellow at the Hoover Institution, this book called The New Deal and Modern American Conservatism, in which they compare Hoover, the post-presidential Hoover, to Edmund Burke. I'll just read one sentence. They say, and this is their thesis, we can now see more clearly that the New Deal was America's French Revolution, and the post-presidential Herbert Hoover, if not our Edmund Burke, was at least a prophetic voice crying in the uh, prophetic voice crying in the progressive wilderness of the 1930s, pointing the way toward what has become modern American conservatism. So they emphasize, and I think correctly, the contributions Hoover made in his later years to that very development. He used the term historic liberalism to describe himself in. Uh, contradistinction to what he called the regimenting false collectivism of the New Deal. He put it this way in 1937 in a letter to William Allen White, I believe. He said one sentence, the New Deal, having corrupted the label of liberalism for collectivism, coercion, and concentration of political power, it seems historic liberalism must be conservatism in contrast. And that's where I think he ended basically as a classical liberal, if you will. With these words of recognition, I would argue, Hoover's political odyssey was complete. And he had become, by the mid-30s, a man of the right. 
So however we judge the continuities and discontinuities of Hoover in office and his successor in office, I would say that in the larger sweep of 20th century history, Hoover, the unflagging anti-New Dealer, contributed heavily to the critique of ever-aggrandizing statism that has become integral to modern American conservatism. It was among the most enduring of his legacies. So perhaps the cycle is going to start again. And I might mention that this book came out coincidentally with that Hoover Crusade Years book, his title, dealing with his post-presidency in domestic politics. The major part of that book is a section which he gives, to which he gives the title, The Crusade Against Collectivism in the United States. Well, I will leave it at that, but close with that quotation that I started with, that we do not live in the past, the past lives in us. And so it seems to me, with the topic, including the Hoover dimension of that, that uh, we've just been discussing. So let that process of reflection and reassessment continue. Thank you. Now, um, as moderator, it is my task to coordinate our discussion for the time that remains. And Katie has told me and the other uh, moderator commenters that it is our right, if we wish to exercise it, to ask the first question. And I shall, if you ever heard, if you've ever known a chairman not to indulge that when given the opportunity. Some years ago, Bernard Balin wrote uh, a piece about the tasks of a working historian. And he said that when a historian looks at the historiography of a field and is looking for opportunities for research and study and so on, he should look at it or she should look at it in terms of needs, gaps, and problems. That is to say, what book do we need in a certain field? Or you know, what gap is there? Is there some character in history who has not been given ample or significant treatment? Or what are the main recurring issues that we struggle with, like a couple of the issues that have just been on display this morning? So my question to each of the, of the presenters would be this. If tomorrow morning you received a MacArthur grant for half a million dollars and had nothing to do for the next five years except write to your heart's content about this field, what needs, gaps, or problems do you think you would be drawn to, or if not you, someone to whom you could give your MacArthur grant. <laughs> Any order you like, if that's, or if you want a moment to meditate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess since I have, uh, hopefully five to ten years ahead of me, what I'm what I'm doing now is to rethinking and refocusing the debates of the Wilson presidency, including what's neglected, which is the debate of Wilson's policy during the war itself and how such factors as the war 14 points were playing out, factors concerning uh, the American military policy, what was called the Chamberlain Committee, the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, and then moving on to debates during the Paris Conference among Americans, how did they perceive, uh, I should say, uh, opinion makers, because there are no polls, and how did they perceive what was happening in Paris? And then rethinking the entire League fight uh, with less stress on the irreconcilables uh, versus the Wilson administration, but more on various and diverse agents of public opinion, not simply concerning the League, but uh, what is the picture of Italy and its desires for the Dalmatian coast? What's the picture concerning Japan and its ventures in Siberia? Uh, this, this kind, kind of matter, how, how rough should the peacemakers be on Germany? Is this peace really a fair peace? And then the importance, which becomes increasingly crucial, is the election of 1920. Because even though neither Harding nor Cox wanted this election to be on the League. The League had been voted down twice. Last time in March 1920, it keeps reoccurring and reoccurring and becoming more and more intense, particularly due to Wilson, who was telling Cox and Roosevelt, don't give up on this issue at all. Uh, fight the campaign on this issue. And I just want to see how important it is 
and how all this has played out. And I'm intrigued by a scholar named Robert Hanneken, who was submitting a press to Cambridge Press where he says that the discontinuity of the Wilson administration to the Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt Taft administration before and the Harding administration after has been way overplayed. That they share the same assumptions concerning freedom of the seas, uh, an open door world, uh, to bringing a kind of tutelage to uh, uh, the benighted races in a sense. It's just a matter of means, whether you do this through a league or not, is where the issues come. And I think this is an interesting way of looking at the period. Well, one, I'd have to reject my day job. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that yet. But <laughs> um, kind of riffing off of something that was coming up as I was doing my research here and considering this is, you know, with regards to children's policy and some of those changing conceptions I had mentioned, um, the issue, of course, of youth criminality. And, and it was a big issue in the progressive era, continues as one through the, the 1920s, and what is to be done about it? How do you deal with um, at-risk youth? And it ties into, to, of course, my, my interest in, in the growing federalization of crime over time, of, of the growth of, of a more professional you know, police, police force and how that ties in with, with children's issues. And I was finding that there, there were gaps there that you know, weren't answering the questions that I'd want to see answered. And so I think that's where I'd spend my time. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's a great question. We could go on for a long time. One, uh, one thing I think um, I'd like to see more work on, Ares Manella has a, a fabulous book called The Wilsonian Moment. And I think there's a lot more room for understanding transnational actors and things happening, in intellectual movements, movements of peoples, goods, uh, ideas, commodities, uh, currency across borders in this era, uh, really breaking down, I think, the facile binary of the wars as these sort of watersheds. I, I see a lot more continuity uh, between uh, in, in transnational sorts of movements before and after World War I. And I think World War II is also a, a sort of uh, far too simplistic uh, watershed when you think about, for example, non-interventionist, anti-interventionist. The same sorts of figures are, are operating in the 30s as, as in the 40s, right? And here you have in the Hoover, uh, in Hoover's orbit, uh, Robert Taft, who I'm working on, for example, who's making very similar arguments in the 30s as he is in the early 50s. So I think there's a lot of room for um, trying to trouble our narratives or, or, or easy periodizations here and also looking at um, an array of, of non-state actors in various shapes and forms. Good. Well, thank you. Good. For, yes, Justice. George, could, could, I, could I ask you a question? Are the historians that stress continuity between the Hoover administration and the New Deal all wet? All wet? All wet. Are they no. all wrong? No, there are, there are obviously um, several areas of continuity. I don't want to take too much time going into that, but the, the, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is a natural example, but also the Emergency Relief and Construction Act of July 1932, I would argue, is really a major uh, bridge from the Hoover period. That is the moment when, for the first time, the federal government entered the relief field in a massive way in the sense that I think a few hundred million were allocated in loans to the states for relief. Hoover did not want direct federal relief. That is a big difference between him and, and the New Deal, I would say. He wanted to keep the community structures uh, going, and he feared, and he later expressed those fears uh, with anger in the 30s, that the New Deal was going to nationalize relief and create political machines, corruption, and so forth. And he cited the problems that happened in Kentucky with the WPA, the scandals that led to the Hatch Act. And so forth. So Hoover saw uh, or argued that uh, you should keep a non political, professionalized community volunteer type response to, uh, to relief and not turn it into federal programs uh, with, with massive numbers of administrators and so forth. So there are both elements of continuity, and there are many more we could, might discuss, but there are some sharp items of discontinuity. And for example, don't forget Hoover vetoed the, pro, the progenitor of the TVA well, while president. He opposed what was the Swope Plan, which you might say was the, uh, the, the forerunner of, of the NRA. 
And before he left office even, this is not all after the fact, he made the statement I think you quoted in either your paper or your, your remarks here, the, uh, the famous statement that this was going to be a decision, the 32 election, that would set the course of the country for 100 years. He later regarded that and often quoted himself later on as, as being one of the most prophetic of all his utterances. So he, by, I, I would say that in a sense Hoover got outflanked on his left in the last year or so of his administration. And he saw, whether we would agree or not, he saw a, a, a massive lurch to the left impending. And, that's, and I think that there's some evidence to that, however you want to evaluate it. Uh, so that even though there are elements of continuity which we can see, I would say that there are significant elements of discontinuity as well. But let's get the audience into the conversation. Uh, perhaps it would be good uh, to ask you for the record since we're being taped to identify yourself and your affiliation if you wish uh, before answering the question. I saw your hand first. Uh, Mark Villicchio, uh, Wellhub University. I have a question for John about the persistence of, of reform. Uh, since we're talking about historiography, I, I recall Alan Davis many decades ago now had this article in American Quarterly, I think, which was a path-breaking article of essay in which he talked about these continuing reform efforts into the 1920s. How well does that hold up? I mean, is that still, are you familiar with it? It's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the idea of you know, continuity and discontinuity and reform has been you know, kind of part and parcel of the whole debate you know, since, since the 20s. So you, know, you see elements of both and yeah, I think, I think it does hold up in that, that sense. Um, you know, the reform continues. It changes, but it continues. And, you know, I don't, you know, you may slow down the pace at times, and I think the 20s is, a, you know, a breath in that sense, you know. If you were kind of running through the progressive era, you know, you do slow down a little bit to, to catch your breath and move forward, but the, the pace continued forward. So uh, that's where I'd, I'd put it. Uh, maybe a little wishy-washy, but, you know, that's the problem with some of this periodization and, and you yes. know, when we're talking over time like that. Uh, James and then... Uh, uh you next. James first. Yeah, uh, I had a question uh, for Chris. Uh, I thought we talked this fabulous. There's one thing I want to push on a little bit. You, you uh, talk about E.H. Carr and talk mm -hmm. about his work sort of uh, approvingly. Uh, I'm not a historian by training. I'm a political scientist, mm -hmm. uh, international relations theorist. And, and for us, E.H. Carr is basically, if you, if you take the influence of William Appleman, Williams, mm -hmm. John Lewis Gaddis, times it by 100, that's how important E.H. Carr is to us. And one of the things that I, maybe I get your comment on, I'd like to know, I mean, E.H. Carr for political scientists reinforces the standard view of the 1920s or 1930s. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at all these dumb people. All they believe in is international law. They don't understand politics or anything else. And one of the things that I've increasingly come to believe over time is, is that we shouldn't read the 20 years crisis anymore. I think Carr has a false understanding of, or a sort of caricatured view of what the 1920s was about. It's a great article by Stephen Wertheim, you know, that was in Diplomatic History a years ago, that I thought was fabulous on this question. And his argument is, Wilson was not a legalist. I mean, he hated people like the Lee who really wanted a legal code and, and everything. And Wilson was really all about having the league as a sort of political body um, that was really going to be devoted to um, peaceful change, yeah. which was actually Carr's entire argument about what should really be happening in the war period. We needed to, to you know, find a way that you know, countries like Germany could peacefully become integrated into the system. So I'm just curious about um, E.H. Carr and how you see that. So I think what a lot of you in this room are doing are actually attacking the sort of E.H. Carr view of the 1920s or the age of war period. So, Awesome. Yeah, so, well, I was quoting him, uh, actually, I think, uh, precisely in the way you're pinpointing, as characteristic of, a, you know, that book is published in 1939, as characteristic of, or maybe even a caricatured version of the understanding of that period, what had gone wrong by 39. So as I sort of really rapidly summarized the literature, um, I think that's a, it's a nice moment to talk about this kind of legal fetishism. And for, from my own work, one thing that's interesting that I think, 
Carr both gets right and gets wrong, are the fascinating sort of strange bedfellow alliances of people more or less on the right, more or less on the left, right? So you have the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom making very similar kinds of claims about legal and moral suasion as people on the right, like William Bora, uh, you know, uh, the famous uh, Republican from Idaho, the irreconcilable, and yet he's for the Kellogg Brand Pact. So how do you put that together? You know, it's, it's a toothless pact, but it has this sort of binding moral suasion component, these nation states um, apply. So it is interesting then to see that someone like Carr would, would um, depict that as both uh, something um, that would be a, potentially a positive uh, component of international relations in the era, but also one hopelessly flawed. And the quote I was picking out was that it's because of this aspirational component that ultimately he seems, or the one way that I read that book is ultimately you need to have enforcement procedures, right? So what's failed in the, in the uh, pacifist internationalist efforts and the, the non-binding uh, sort of um, arms control efforts were, were the fact that there, there weren't sufficient safeguards um, I, but I, I think it should be read as characteristic of the era, perhaps not so much as uh, cutting edge historiography or political science today. That would be my take. Okay. Uh, David Greenberg, Rutgers University. Thanks for being my IP partner. <laughs> uh, first, a quick comment on the question of what becomes of progressivism in the 20s. I want to recommend to everyone a fabulous dissertation where I served as an outside reader a couple years ago by Kevin Murphy. Uh, <coughs> he's not going on academia, he's a speech writer on Capitol Hill, but he has posted online the entire dissertation. Uh, I hope he gets a publisher, but he has about 1,500 pages. Uh, so he'll be editing it first. But it's, it's terrific. Uh, and really looks at, you know, from Bora to the New Republic, different varieties of progressive and where can they come down on different issues as the 20s progress. Um, I want to ask a question about the community <coughs> and the interwar question. Um, and Justice sort of addresses this on the back half of the continuities going into the New Deal. But coming out of World War I, I mean, this may be stating the obvious, but clearly the war creates huge disruptions, <coughs> reevaluations, changes in mood. It leads to three Republican presidents after uh, Wilson. So clearly there are big breaks and rejections by the public of certain tendencies, uh, certain decisions, and impulses. Um, how much of that do we want to lose in sort of trying to, once again, as the story has been trying for 50 years or more, kind of you know, debunk the notion of this complete break, of this reactionary turn. Um, isn't there a lot that we have to retain, and don't we, in our revisionist efforts, uh, you know, skirt close to losing sight of these very obvious and important shifts? Yeah. Well, I, I have one immediate response, which is I think, and this is maybe the classic historian's response, to go farther back in time. But I see a lot of continuities from, say, the imperialist, anti-imperialist debates with the critique of World War I. Um, and so the questions about, say, special, the role of special interests in getting the US involved in conflicts not in the nation's best interest or vital interest variously defined. You can go farther back into the 1870s, 1880s to see that in smaller examples, Venezuela boundary crisis, Hawaii, Chile, um, things like that. Uh, so I see these continuities in the sort of uh, intellectual framework of grappling with what is the proper U.S. role in the world given rising commercial and military power. So I, I wouldn't say that it's the abrupt <clears throat> break. Now the rethinking of the U.S. role in World War I is a discontinuity because of course the U.S. joins the war and then if you look at the historiography in the 20s and 30s, you know, famously Beard and Tansel and we could all go on and on, um, Walter Millis, uh, you know, the path to war, reconceptualizing that is different. But that then informs, you could then create another neat continuity as it informs what Justice has written so much about. Why does the U.S. take so long to get involved in the Second World War, right? So you, have, you could have this rupture, a longer continuity and parallel to that another sort of sinuous strand or subterranean sort of set of concepts that are embedded in the next thinking through of what is the proper relationship in a, in a global cataclysm or, or the looming one. In 1960, Arthur Link wrote an article in the American Historical Review called 
whatever happened to the progressive movement, where he sees strong strains of progressivism lasting all through the 20s. I mean, the progressives certainly didn't have the presidency and they didn't have the Supreme Court, but they were quite strong in the Congress and certain legislation that we look at today as reactionary, conservative, retrogressive legislation, such as immigration, for example, uh, prohibition, were seen as strongly progressive moves. Uh, you look at farm policy, you look at public utilities and foreign policy, you look at the Washington Conference, for example, you look at the Dawes Plan. Uh, I don't think Wilson would have had objection to either one of these at all. Um, you know, Harding, Coolidge, and, and Hoover were all supporters of suffrage. They were, um, you know, they had elements of, of the, they had, you know, major elements of the whole progressive movement. You know, they, they learned from Teddy Roosevelt, you know, partisan-wise, of course, they rejected Wilson and, and presented in a sense a very different style than Wilson or even Roosevelt. <coughs> Um, you know, they weren't these larger than life guys in, in many ways. You know, you look at their public image. But as far as their, their policies go, you know, they, they weren't trying to roll things back. You know, they, they rejected bits and pieces here and there, but, you know, other aspects move forward. So, you know, it kind of becomes that, that complex, you know, it's neither here nor there. It's not a rejection. It's not a, you know, full-blooded continuation either. Although I would respectfully disagree in, in, one, in terms of the wartime state, right? We were talking about this a little bit last night. I mean, the hope for people like Dewey is that you will have this plastic juncture for progressive reform and a much strong, more central, you know, set of, right? Well, you always had that, that contingent and they that wanted like more, that. much more. Yeah. But, you know, overall, kind of as a national mood goes, it, it was a little more subdued, I think. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, before I ask for another question, Katie, we're running a little beyond the time. Should we take another question or two, or? All right, fine. By Casey Johnson, Brooklyn College. Yes. Okay. I have a question, uh, question for, for, for Chris, but it's a very interesting talk. To what extent do you think that the, the development of Wilsonian and Wilsonianism has distorted either the popular conception of Wilson's foreign policy or the conception of Wilson's foreign policy among uh, commentators. Mm -hmm. yeah, for instance, let, let's say you mentioned Wilsonian peaking in the 90s. So if you're, if you're advocating for intervention in Bosnia in the 1990s on grounds that this is a Wilsonian foreign policy, doesn't that necessarily mean that you're going to raise this question of how idealist Wilson was that you were asking in a particular way? Because you know, if you're saying let's intervene in Bosnia, you're not going to be spending a lot of time as saying the intervention in Haiti is a representative example of Wilson's foreign policy. Right. Yeah. That, I think your question is also its own answer in some ways. Right. That in fact. Um, the popular conception is, is very much, uh, well, one thing that I was intrigued by was in, in doing this sort of modest research, I, I won't say it's conclusive, um, but on Wilsonianism, that it, it's so prominent today, right? And, and, and that it tracks really neatly from the late 90s, it's sort of a, especially a post 9-11 kind of boomlet of thinking about this, right? Um, and, and you have both the critics of it, uh, the sort of, uh, as well as exponents of a kind of humanitarian, I could think of Samantha Power, for example, a kind of idealistic humanitarian orientation to the world. Um, you know, that, that what Clinton got wrong in Rwanda is exactly what the U.S. needs to get right in the 21st century. Um, now, would, would uh, and I haven't tracked the, the use of the term specifically to say Bosnia versus Haiti or, or even uh, retrospective thinking about Rwanda or something like that, but um, it's one thing that really stands out in this is that even historians, I think, um, are so inflected with the, the presentist connotations uh, and implications of what is Wilson, uh, such that we often um, do a disservice to Wilson's own rhetoric and thinking, which itself changed in, in two administrations. And that, that's, uh, that may be the biggest takeaway there, that the, that the um, patterns of revisionism about Wilson uh, say a lot more about us and a lot less about Wilson. Justice, you want to add? Yeah. Is Wilsonian really the same in 1914 as in 1917? And is that really the same as in 1919? In other words, 
How much does Wilsonian itself as a concept change over time? Are we dealing with the same breed of cat throughout? Uh, certainly not, no. I mean, uh, it's 1915 is when I see the first major uses mm -hmm. of it. And then um, around 1921, it begins to be uh, much, much less used yeah. as a term. Um, and then it rises again in, the, in 31 with a vengeance. But when they use and, it, they're usually talking way. about the Wilson of 1919, are right. they not? Yes. When this yeah. term is used. Much more, in the, starting in the you 30s, it's, it's much more of the Wilson, well, really the lead debate. Yeah, the Article 10 Wilson. Yes, exactly. Um, and more recently, I think there's a term called hard Wilsonianism now. <laughs> and I suppose that means there's a soft Wilsonianism That's somewhere low. as well. Yeah. So that it just <clears throat> emphasizes your point that present-minded concerns continue to fuel this mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, is there a new hand? Uh, yes, sir, please identify yourself. Mason Williams, I teach here. Um, the, this has to do with the change of continuity question. And it seems to me that the primary problem is that progressivism is not a particularly useful category of analysis. And a way around that might be to sort of disaggregate by sight. Um, and um, Justice has sort of uh, pointed toward this already, but um, so state and local governments, for instance, um, as Dr. Fox laid out very well in the paper, I think, are doing basically progressive era stuff, right? Human capital investment and a huge sort of rise in public school funding, um, decommodification with the sort of early um, you know, quasi-public housing projects. Um, Congress, which is another site, um, and that's where the folks who call themselves progressive with the capital P are, right? The La Follette Norris group. Um, there, it seems to me, they're trying to leverage the sort of state-building legacy of World War I to create a more progressive national political economy. So you've got these debates, you know, how much of the progressive wartime tax code are we going to keep, which they win initially, by the way. Um, you know, Muscle, Muscle Shoals comes to mind, uh, McNary Hagen in a different sense, in some ways even immigration restriction. Um, so it's, it's, you know, if you think about the different sort of places where these debates play out, I think it might be a way to think, you know, where are their changes, where are their continuities? And, you know, there, World War I seems a definite break um, in, the, in the Congress, um, you know, less so maybe at the state and local level. Any other questions? Uh, Questions? Uh, maybe, maybe one more in the back. Yeah, I'm uh, George Sidney, I'm unaffiliated. Um, question for Justice. We we're talking about the scope of Hoover. And it seems to me that one of the questions that he had scope, you know, we're talking about how he was uh, uh, friendly with uh, Brandeis early on and then for the gold border later. Is it more that he didn't have scope, but he just simply changed over time, became more conservative over time? Rather than get his breath, rather than he actually became. You know, now well, I enough. think it's a matter of having to define yourself against Franklin Roosevelt, who he intensely disliked as a human being, beginning 1926 to 28. I'd, I'd certainly say by 28. Beforehand, uh, uh, Franklin and Lou Henry Hoover and uh, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt were, were quite good friends. In fact, in 1920, Franklin Roosevelt said, uh, shouldn't Hoover be President of the United States, he certainly is a wonder. But I, I think in Hoover's effort to defend his administration against strong, vehement, and at times vicious attacks by Roosevelt, and particularly the Democratic uh, National Committee, headed by Charles Michelson, who wrote this book, The Ghost Who Talks, Hoover uh, rigidified his views. George might differ with me on this, and George knows a lot more than I do. But I think we see a different Hoover by the 30s and 40s than we do as president and before president. But George, what do you think? I'll just make a couple quick comments. I think one of the main themes of Hoover's post-presidency is this quest for vindication. Mm -hmm. It comes in the multi-volume memoirs that he wrote and, and all sorts of other activities. So that, that has a, a personal temperamental uh, vigor to it, that so your, your point I, I would, I would uh, accept in that regard. I think one would have to say that Hoover sincerely thought that he perceived a fundamental turning in 1933 and that this was setting the republic in a, in a wrong direction. And so partly, part of what drove him to get up in the morning, and he'd get up about six in the morning and work all day, even into his 80s, was this sense that he had a not just a mission to clear his name, so to speak, but a mission, a crusade. He liked, loved the mm -hmm. word, he loved, liked to see himself as a crusader to, to 
restore a, a, an America without the statist uh, infusion. So he, he, he rails against statism, creeping, socialism, collectivism, and so on. Those are terms you don't hear him using too much, except that in the late 20s, in a famous speech in 28, he accused the Democrats of supporting state socialism in public power, and Al Smith was outraged, and so was FDR. So you can even then find in Hoover a, a revulsion against what he saw as socialism, the, the overweening state. So there is some continuity in Hoover's thought, I would say, right through the period. It isn't all a kind of invention because he's been burned by the bad experience and vilification and so forth. That intensifies it, but I would say there's an intellectual dimension as well. Um, and I think probably I should remind us of another quotation, uh, which I think was made by Arthur Schlesinger. He said that history is a conversation without end. <laughs> but even historians have to take a break. <laughs> And so, with thanks to our distinguished panel and to all of you, I declare this meeting.